church, only two minutes left until the service starts. That's enough time to grab a coffee or snack, get your Bible, and find a comfortable spot before it all begins. See you soon. found in Psalm 59, uh, verses 16 and 17. And it says, But I will sing of your strength. In the morning I will sing of your love. For you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. O oh, my strength, I sing praise to you. You, O oh God, are my fortress, my loving God. I will sing of your strength. And uh, I do trust that over the course of this week, you've had time to sing of God's strength and God's love. We serve an awesome God, and I do trust that that is the, the song of your soul uh, this week. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed, we are not at uh, Monk Boulevard. We're not at the church. And uh, Justin and I have, and our family have had uh, some time booked away with the kids, and uh, so we had to pre-record this. Um, but the great thing about that is it means that we are watching alongside with our family. And uh, it also means that we're praying for you this morning as we watch. And uh, we we anticipate that God will be speaking through everything that happens in this service. So um, we will be going back to doing it live, uh, not next week, but the week after. Um, but we do pray that you'll be blessed through um, through the services. Um, we just have a couple of announcements that we want to share with you this morning. Uh, the first one is we had our VBS, the Vacation Bible School, online uh, this past week. And we want to say a very big thank you to Elizabeth Borgella, who um, put a ton of work into this. And I know she put her heart and her soul into it and cared deeply um, about the message that she was bringing. And so we thank you so much for doing that. We also thank the kids that were able to join. Um, I can speak from experience and say that my kids had the best time. Uh, they were going around this week singing uh, songs, praising God, and what a blessing as a mother to hear that. Um, but I also know that they, they learned a lot about Jesus and who he is. They learned a lot about our God. And so I'm incredibly grateful. Um, I would also encourage you um, to watch the pre-video 
um, to the service next week, the introduction, because we'll have some video, some uh, pictures of some of the kids doing their VBS stuff. And if you're a parent that had um, your child at the VBS, we'd encourage you to send us pictures as well so we can add that to the slideshow. Um, we want everyone to see what the kids are doing and the great time they had. And uh, if you're a member of our congregation or someone that's joining us and you want to send in a picture of what you're doing throughout the week, we're still taking pictures. We try to update it, um, you know, every week so that we can um, show you what everyone is doing and so that we can remember that we are a church family. And even though we can't meet together in the same place, um, that we are still a family. We are still a church family and we want to be praying for one another. And sometimes having that visual um, is helpful. So don't uh, don't be shy. Send us your pictures. We want to see that. Um, we want to just remind you that we're continuing on in our Disney series. Um, and next week, we're going to be looking at the movie Aladdin. So I would encourage you to refresh your mind with that video and um, see if you can pick out some Bible themes found in the video and uh, we'll see what comes to us next week um, in the service. Um, we also just want to mention, some people have been asking us about how they can contribute their tithe. Um, so how they can contribute financially to the ministry that we're doing at Montreal Citadel. Um, we may not be able to meet in person, but we are still doing ministry. And that does cost money. And so if you are looking to tithe, if you are looking to contribute financially, at the end of this um, service, there will be a slide up that shows you all the ways that you can make that happen. Um, we will, uh, we, we commit that we will put that to good use and uh, we will put that to furthering the kingdom um, by, you know, sharing in ministry. Um, so take a look for that at the end of the video. Um, in just a moment, we're going to sing together, and I do want to take the opportunity once again to thank our musicians, to thank the band and Glenn for um, coming and um, preparing some music for us to um, be able to just worship God from where we are. And we're going to do that um, in just a few moments by singing Glad in the Lord. Um, and then immediately following that, we're going to have uh, the scripture reading that's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21. And we also thank um, all of those who participate in reading the scripture this week. We're blessed to have a family come together and um, read the scripture for us. So thank you, Mappy and Joshua and Leo for, for joining us in ministry this week. We're going to bow in prayer and then we're going to sing songs of praise to God. Let's bow in prayer together. Gracious God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that you are an awesome God that meets us exactly where we are. We thank you, God, that um, you've given us this day to enjoy. You've given us the technology to um, come together as a church family in this way. God, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for the encouragement they are. I thank you for the love they show. I thank you for who they are in the body of Christ. God, we pray over the service this morning. We pray that everything that is said, everything that is done will be for you, will be of you, will be a blessing to those that receive it. God, we thank you that we can continue to meet together. God, I pray for the service and I pray for your servant, for Justin, who's going to bring the word in just a few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So join us together as we sing with the help of the band.
El mensaje de la paz con Dios. Por eso, sabiendo que el Señor hay que tenerle reverencia, procuremos convencer a los hombres. Dios nos conoce muy bien y espero que también ustedes nos conozcan. No es que nos hayamos puesto otra vez a alabarnos a nosotros mismos, sino que les estamos dando a ustedes una oportunidad de sentirse orgullosos de nosotros, para que puedan contestar a quienes presumen que las apariencias y no de lo que hay en el corazón. Pues si estamos locos es para Dios y si no lo estamos es para ustedes. El amor de Cristo se ha apoderado de nosotros desde que comprendimos que uno murió por todos y que por consiguiente todos han muerto. Y Cristo murió por todos para que los que viven ya no vivan para sí mismos, sino para Él, que murió y resucitó por ellos. Así, de maintenant, no conocemos personas según la chair. Et si nous avons connu Christ selon la chair, maintenant nous ne connaissons plus de cette manière. Et si quelqu'un est, est en Christ, il est une nouvelle créature. Les choses anciennes sont passées, voici toutes les choses sont devenues nouvelles. Et tout cela vient de Dieu, qui nous a réconciliés avec lui par Christ, et qui nous a donné le ministère de la réconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be seen for us, That in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you so much to uh, Leo and Mappy and Joshua for uh, sharing with us the scripture from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And so this week we continue in our summer, summer sermon series, Tale as Old as Time, the Bible and Disney, by looking at uh, a movie that's found a special place in the story of of our family, uh, mine, Colleen, and the kids. Uh, that movie is if you've paid attention to our services or if you've been uh, checking us out on our social media or um, usually we mentioned it earlier on, but we didn't today. But the movie this week is The Lion King, a movie significant to us for a number of reasons, uh, because of the, mu uh, the music, because of the story, Uh, because of the recent live action version that was one of the first ones that the younger kids saw in the theater, uh, because of the Simba diary that Colleen used to write in when she was 12 about me, um, when we first started to, uh, to get together to date uh, when we were younger. But as I paused to reflect um, this week on this movie and what it meant, there was one story that seemed to come to my mind over and over and over again. And it was one from the uh, the early days of our married life, uh, just after we got married. And so Colleen was at home, I was at work, and she was there with Malachi, who probably would have been, I don't know, maybe three years old, maybe a little bit older than that. And uh, he'd been watching Lion King earlier in the day, and they sat down for lunch. And just as they sat down, Malachi looked up, Colleen said sweetly from his lunch and said, Mommy, can't wait for you and daddy to die. Colleen obviously was a little shocked and perplexed about what he was talking about uh, and asked him, Malachi, why would you say that? Why would you want me and daddy to die? And his response in all his Lion King induced wisdom was, because when you die, then I get to be king. That apparently his takeaway from watching the movie Uh, was that the most important part of the story was that Simba had to wait to become king for his father to die. So naturally, for him to be king, I would have to get out of the way. We would have to get out of the way. So I laugh about this story now, but I probably didn't sleep well for days after it, worried that something was going to happen to me. And at the same time, I'm still not sure what he thought he was going to be the king of. Whether there was some kingdom that I didn't know about or some fortune that I wasn't aware of that he was going to inherit and that that was going to become his as the time came along. But whatever it was, I, I have to admire the fact that he was able to see beyond. 
his desire to look beyond the surface with movies, and to open himself up to hear something a little bit more, to see something a little bit different, to take from it what the movie was trying to say to him. Because isn't that what movies are made of? Movies are made to tell us a story, yes. But our experience, our situation, our beliefs will shape how we see them, how we hear them, what they truly say to us. Sometimes things that maybe even those who made them don't understand or didn't see for themselves. Now, this is something we've been doing all summer as we've taken on this summer sermon series, taking these classic Disney movies and digging deep within them to find biblical context, to find these little biblical truths that we can find within them. Now, if you haven't seen The Lion King, I apologize for the spoiler a few minutes ago about, unfortunately, what happens to Simba's father. But in order for us to get to where we need to go in this sermon, I'm going to need you to be on the same page as me. So I'm going to catch you up. The Lion King is the story of Simba. He's the lion cub, the heir to the throne, the son of uh, Mufasa and Sarabi. So he lives with his family in the Pride Lands, and that family includes his Uncle Scar. Uncle Scar, who resents his brother, the king, and his new nephew, who's the the heir to the throne, who's taken his place as second in line. Simba's life is going well until the unfortunate passing of his father in a wildebeest incident, and then Simba is forced to flee the Pride Lands. A misunderstanding around what happened, he's led to believe that he was the cause of his father's death. So Simba runs off into the desert, left for dead until he's found by his new friends, Timon the meerkat and Pumbaa the warthog, who bring Simba in and teach him their problem-free philosophy, Hakuna Matata, which means no worries for the rest of your days. Everything seems to be going well for Simba. But back home, back in the Pride Lands, things aren't going quite so well. You see, Scar has brought an imbalance to the perfect circle of life that had existed before amongst all living things and all of the created world. Scar has brought his hyena friends in and they've thrown a disruption into all that was going on. Life is not what it should be, but all of that changes. When Nala, Simba's friend from childhood, comes out looking for food, chases Pumbaa, and ends up face to face with her friend who she thought was long dead. This leads to a disagreement between the lions about whether Simba should go back, an encounter with Rafiki the baboon who is not his uncle, and Simba returning to the Pride Lands, waging war against his uncle, facing the past he'd been running from, and ultimately taking his place as the one true Lion King. Now, if you've seen the movie, you'll know that I'm leaving a lot out, that there are things that I've just kind of glossed over to get to where we are, that there's more to the story than, say, a small wildebeest accident that leads to the untimely death of Simba's father, Mufasa. You'll also know that within it there are a number of biblical themes, a number of biblical truths that we could uh, pick up and we could go with this morning. But as I did my preparation this week, there was one of these truths that seemed to stick out to me the most, seemed to come to mind the most for me. And it was one that happens during the encounter between Rafiki and Simba that I just mentioned. Simba has just been caught up by Nala on all that's going on back in the Pride Lands, and he wanders off to find out what's going on, to clear his mind, to begin to process all that he's heard all that he's going through, all that he's struggling with. And as he does, he comes upon Rafiki, this baboon who leads him through this winding tree down to some water. He gets to see his father in the clouds in this big uh, scene where he shows up to him and shares with him a reminder. Remember who you are. That he's Mufasa's son, the one true king. 
And then there's this moment between Simba and Rafiki. Now, I had planned to show you this on the screen this week, but because of copyrights and all of those things, we're not really allowed to do that. So unfortunately, you're stuck with me describing it to you. So Simba's in the middle of this field. He's just seen his father. And he said that the, the comment comes up that change is coming. And Simba says, going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. At that moment, Rafiki grabs the stick that he's holding, smacks him on the head. Simba goes, ah, what was that for? His response is, it doesn't matter. It was in the past. Simba, still smarting from the hit on his head, says, yes, but it still hurts. And this is the moment. Rafiki says to him, yes, the past can hurt, but the way I see it, you can either run from it or you can learn from it. He goes to hit Simba again. Simba ducks, having learned from his past mistake. For Simba, this moment in the movie was a reminder that he was defined, he was not defined, sorry, by the mistake in his past. That the thing preventing him from the future that he was to have, that he was meant to live, was not this choice in the past, but his choices in the present. That he was not defined by what had happened, but by whose son he was. His rightful place in the circle of life. That if he did not return, there would be this continued imbalance. That it would need to be filled for things to go back to the way they were intended to be. And so realizing this, Simba returns. He wins the fight and the movie closes just as it opened. A baby lion cub, this one Simba's child, being presented to all the animals who have returned to the Pride Lands. The sun shining, the grass growing, the circle becoming complete. All created order united in one space to honor the Lion King. Reconciliation found in the Pride Lands and a return to the way that things were intended to be. A lesson from this film that hopefully you've picked up on where I'm going. Because I believe this idea was spelled out for us in the words from, uh, of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth to kind of set the record straight about what it meant to be a believer of Jesus. Now, Paul had already written to them once. In Paul's first letter to the church, 1 Corinthians, he had been, uh, it had been an instruction to them on how to live the Christian life, on how to become more mature in their beliefs, to deepen their bond with one another and with Christ while turning away from those who would create division within the body of believers. Having sent this Paul believes that this has been handled, and yet he receives word that there are those who have come along and have begun to teach the people that while he was writing about unity and maturity, they were calling into question his teaching, his authority, the message that he had been sending to them, claiming that what was being done was for his glory, for Paul's glory as opposed to God's, to build up his own disciples. That this message of the surpassing grace, love, and mercy of God through Jesus was not to be believed because it required faith in those things that you couldn't see, as opposed to seeing the evidence right before you. So in this next letter in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to dispel those rumors, to get rid of those concerns. He tells them, I didn't come to see you as I had planned, not because I'm hiding from things but because I genuinely couldn't get there. And this is the beginning of chapter one. He then tells them, you're to forgive those who are causing grief, who are bringing disunity. He says, forgive them because I would forgive them if I were there as well. And he reminds them that this message was not one of earthly profit for him, but of heavenly reward. And that's second Corinthians chapter two. And then Paul turns his attention to the past in chapter 3, leading into our passage in chapter 5 that was read a little earlier by Matthew and Leo and Joshua. He reminds the people of Corinth that they are not bound by the old ways anymore, 
that those who were teaching that they needed to follow the old ways of doing things, the ways of Moses, the ways of the law, the ministry that brought death engraved in letters on stone, as he says in chapter 3 and 7, were missing the point of what this was all about now. That Jesus coming, living, dying, and being resurrected took off the veil that Moses had to wear when he came down from the mountain and the people couldn't see the glory of the Lord. Paul was saying that people were able to see God's glory for themselves now and to embrace it if they chose to. And that in doing that, they're being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And that's chapter 3, verse 18. That they were to move beyond the faith of their past to embrace Christ's leading in their lives in the present. To re receive resurrection life in the future he built. In, and this is in chapter 4. The idea of an internal house in heaven that would be received by acceptance through faith, not by sight given by the grace of God, done through living a life pleasing to him as they await their time before his throne, their own judgment day. A moment when they would need to answer for the life they had lived. Paul was saying that they needed to have a healthy fear of the awesomeness, sovereignty, and holiness of their God. Paul is telling the people this is what life is in Christ is about. It's about a freedom to finally be who you were created to be in the image of God. <coughs> to die to self, to the world, to the old way, and to live in Christ. To live a life in perfect relationship with God has, had been intended back in the garden before the original sins of Adam and of Eve. Paul was telling them that they were to live life out of their mind as he had been described because of the love of God and that they were to experience what, what he meant when he said that Christ's love compels us because we are concerned that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from an earthly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Paul is saying this is the new way of living. To forget the past. To stop running from it, but learn from it, as Rafiki urged Simba. To take the lessons and move forward in their newfound life, no longer carrying the weight and the burdens of the mistakes of their past. Paul's telling them to accept this new life meant to be brand new and to accept this place, their place in the circle of life, the greater balance of human existence. Paul's saying the greater purpose for their lives is to be in the family of God to walk in a personal relationship with him, with their fellow people, with the created world around them, a life of reconciliation that Paul continues to build and concludes this passage in verses 18 to 21 with. Reconciled to God through Jesus, bringing to, the, to him all of those who would believe. And then, as a believer as a follower, as a son or a daughter of God, to go and take that message of reconciliation and restoration to the world. To share Paul's message with them. To go in to say, we import you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That just as Simba had to be reconciled to bring back balance in the circle of life in the Pride Lands, the believer needs to be reconciled in their life in order to bring about the process of reconciliation in the lives of those around them and in the world at large. That that reconciliation becomes possible for their family, for their friends, for their neighbors, for their co-workers, for those around them. Paul is urging his readers to make the most of this second chance that they've been given. 
not to be defined by their mistakes, but to remember who they are and whose they are, that they are a child of the king, adopted into the family of God, and then that they're to go and to live their lives in that way, bringing others to the same reality and truth for themselves. A call that continues, friends, to this day, because while we find ourselves living centuries later, we are still part of that same reality, that same circle of life, that same balance that needs to be found. We can find ourselves in these days of COVID-19 and in the days before it, looking back at the good old days or longing for things to get back to normal. But the reality is that those things for good and for bad are in the past. We've been made new and we are being made new every day. That we, The way we used to do things in the world before we've, we experienced all the things that we're experiencing now are gone. And we have a new way to live our lives as new creations in Christ, as his new church to the world. We can run from our past. We can carry the weight of our burdens and our mistakes. We can return to our old way of doing things as soon as we're allowed to. Or we can learn from those things and move forward. We must choose to be people reconciled to God, acknowledging our past, owning our mistakes, seeking forgiveness, and then most importantly, moving on. Moving forward, reconciled, and restored to, re to the relationship we were intended to have back in the beginning of time. Reconciled to see and reconciled to be agents of change in our world and in the lives of those who are close to us. Reconciled to take our place in the circle of life and to see the world around us brought back to balance and unity, to be agents of reconciliation in the world, helping in our, our brothers and sisters to come to a saving faith, for them to be reconciled, to go and to reconcile others. We are called out of our old life and into the new life to be agents of reconciliation and breaking the chains of oppression and racism that hold back so many of our brothers and sisters. To seek reconciliation for our sisters whose voices have been silenced in our communities and in our churches. To seek restoration for our children and for our brothers and sisters who have been victims of abuse to speak reconciliation into, the, into lives and families torn apart by beliefs rooted in judgment because of language and race, religion, identity, and orientation. We're to live new lives and to see lives made new through the power of the risen Jesus. To take to heart and speak with boldness to be out of our minds through the truth that Paul proclaimed to the people of Corinth, that through God's love and our belief in Christ's selfless sacrifice, we find our true identity as a new creation, as a child of God. Not defined by our pasts, but reconciled by him in the present for the future, to take up his call to reconcile the world to him as well. And would you join me now in prayer? And Father, we bow before you in these moments, thankful for your presence in our lives, for the ways that you continue to shape us, for the reality that we are a new creation in you. And God, I just pray right now for any of my brothers and sisters who are listening, who maybe don't know that they're a new creation, who haven't been made a new creation in you, that in these moments, they would find that strength to reach out to you and say, God, I don't want to be defined by my past. I don't want to be defined by the things that I've done by my worst mistake. I want to be defined as your son, as your daughter, as your child. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to accept you into my life so I can be a new creation from this day forward to go and to bring reconciliation in my world and in the world at large. 
Father, continue to use us as your church. Help us to reconcile with one another, to reconcile with those who might hurt us and oppress us, who might treat us poorly, but that we would see in this lifetime your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That that means giving away the things that we want and we desire, but accepting what you want from us, what you need us to be and to know and to do. Bless us. Bless my brothers and sisters. Go ahead of us. Go behind us. Go beside us. Go within us. In, out into the world to bring reconciliation and balance, to find our space in that circle of life. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. I pray that you've been blessed today, that you've been blessed by the music that we've heard, by the words of prayer, by the, the scripture that was read, by the message that was just shared. Go from this place as a new creation. From wherever you are to whatever you'll do, go to bring reconciliation to the world. We live in a broken, fragmented, divisive world. But we know that the power of God, that the love of Jesus can overcome all of those things, can repair families and lives that have been broken down, can bridge the gaps that divide us, can bring us all in together as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, part of his greater family. So I urge you to go, to go and to be reconciliation, to go and speak reconciliation, to accept reconciliation from God into his family. I'll do the same. And if we each do it in our own little corner, imagine the light that will shine out. We're going to sing through the words of the, uh, the song, Candle of the Lord. It speaks of being that light into the darkness. That's what Paul was talking about. That's what Jesus urged us to be. That's what we hope to be into this world. And so as we do, allow it to sink in, prayerfully sing it through, just focus on the words, just listen to the piano play it through. Be blessed. Go to be that light, that candle of the Lord into the world. We love you. We miss you. We long to see you. And uh, we look forward to sharing again with you in worship next week.